So yeah, welcome everybody to the third information session we've held in total, the first for this year. Uh, again, my name is Brandon Wells and I'll MC for this uh, session today. So here's an overview of the agenda. Um, we will start now with a welcome address as well as a land acknowledgement. Um, then Professor Avram Gottlieb will speak. He's a program director, followed by presentations from field directors and um, the field director of the clinical embryology program, Dr. Heather Shapiro, as well as Dr. Scott Hamilton and Kelsey Halawishka. And then the pathologist assistants will have Dr. Fang Liu, who is the PA field director, Will Sui, the education and clinical coordinator, and Amy Cavallini, who's a practicing PA, followed by a presentation from Miriam Khalil, who's a representative from CLAMS, which is our student group in the department. And then after all of our presentations are done, we're going to have breakout sessions, um, where the CE and PA prospective students can meet with staff, um, the core teaching team, as well as some students from most programs. We have two different sessions because there are a lot of prospective students who are interested in both programs. So this will give an opportunity for those to just meet with representatives from each program. And then at the end, we'll kind of just open everything up and have a last minute question and answer period to cover any questions that weren't covered during the breakout sessions. So before we start today, we'd like to um, do a land acknowledgement. So we wish to acknowledge the land on which University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, we know we're all working, we're all intending remote, but we think it is very important to always acknowledge the land which university sits on. Um, I myself live near the university, so I'm also on this land as I work. Um, so I kind of challenge all of you, if you are living in North America, just to kind of look up some of the history of the land you are currently working on and living on, and just kind of just learn a bit more about the history. Um, so this is myself, Brandon Wells. He has an intro slide, um, just to help you all get to know me a little bit better. Um, you can see I've done my undergraduate degree and master's at the University of Toronto, and these are a lot of my interests. Um, sorry, my colleague Ian Marquez, who's also very experienced in the field, and he also has similar designations from the University of Toronto. He is a graduate administrator, and he is currently kind of on the admissions, um, oversees a lot of the admissions. So please feel free to reach out to myself or Ian Marquez if any questions you have regarding admissions or applications. And lastly, this is my dog, Brady. I feel like it's necessary to mention him because this is, around, this is after 5 p.m. So my wife usually comes home shortly. So if you hear him barking at the door, um, you'll kind of know why. You won't just think it's some weird sounds that I'm somehow making. It's definitely him. So first up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Avram Gottlieb, who is the uh, professor in our department, as well as the program director. Hey, can you give me my first slide? Then? Oh yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Brandon, and I welcome all the uh, students. And uh, the hope is uh, over the next uh, bit of time that we're able to um, uh, show you what our program is about and also probably even more important to give you an opportunity to ask questions and to get more information. And also to uh, consider that this is just the beginning. We're uh, available, of course, after for uh, further questions and further inquiries from you. So let me just start with the question is why Masters of Health Sciences in Laboratory Medicine? And um, we'll talk about what this really means over the next uh, hour or so. But beginning with, uh, we're dealing with a highly respected careers that provide people in need with essential health care. So we're part of the healthcare team. There is great satisfaction from uh, the practitioners, both the pathologist assistant and the clinical embryology folks in being an important part of the full pathology and clinical embryology team. And you learn how to do that. 
faculty teachers that you're going to be exposed to are highly skilled clinical, educational, and research laboratory physicians, uh, pathologist assistants who will have a, a very important role in training you, and clinical embryologists, again, having a very important role. There is, throughout the program, extensive career mentorship, so you don't just float through the program. There's a lot of interaction with um, the faculty uh, and the uh, folks that are educating you. There are five uh, students admitted in each of the fields, so it's a small program and lots of one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, teaching. Finally, networking with uh, CE and PAs who are uh, practicing. They're in the hospitals and clinics at the university and industry, and uh, you get a really good opportunity to find out uh, who to speak to as you uh, go through uh, your program. Next, please. So what are the two uh, professions? The first is a pathologist assistant. And basically, and you'll hear much more about this and, and get a firsthand um, impressions from people who are doing this. But in general, uh, the pathologist assistant <coughs> contributes to diagnostic services in anatomical pathology through application of knowledge of tissue and laboratory analysis of specimens. Uh, so you're working in um, a diagnostic service. Clinical embryologists contribute to clinical management via application of assisted reproductive technology in clinical embryology laboratories. So once again, it's uh, working with the assisted reproductive technologies uh, in um, uh, laboratories. Next, please. So the objectives of the program are as follows. We want uh, our graduates to understand the scientific basis and research that provide the foundation for the professional practice of these two uh, fields and disciplines. We want our graduates to achieve academic and applied skills required to work effectively in the discipline. Uh, we want our graduates to gain the ability to be uh, very good problem solvers, to be critical scholars, to be innovative, uh, to be leaders, and to uh, understand uh, the moral and ethical issues around the practice of both the PA and CE fields. And we want uh, to provide our graduates with the tools to be critical learners and embrace the changes in the field as they occur as we move to precision medicine and patient-centered healthcare. So we're uh, a very dynamic um, uh, field and uh, it becomes very critical for uh, you entering the field uh, within the two years of the program to become uh, self-learners uh, and be very confident in, in that particular activity. And then we want to provide you with a valuable student experience. So you're part of a, a larger uh, department of laboratory medicine and pathobiology. And uh, again, you're part of the faculty of medicine. And then again, you're part of the University of Toronto. So there's a, a vast array of student activities that you can uh, partake in at the local and more uh, global level on campus. Next, please. I'll now pass it on to uh, Dr. Heather Shapiro, who will take you through the clinical embryology. Heather. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, so first of all, Brandon, you've got me thinking about my favorite place at the university. Um, I might say the dining room at Hart House. It sort of reminds me of something out of Harry Potter. Um, and second choice would be the Sir Daniel Wilson residence where I lived when I was an undergrad. Um, but enough about me. Uh, I think uh, when people are at the crossroads of their education, they're sort of asking two related questions. One is, where do I want to be in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years? And the second is, what is the path I wanna to take to get there? So just to 
echo what Professor Gottlieb said. I think that clinical embryology is really the nexus of science uh, and medicine and not just technology, but I think something that Scott Hamilton will elaborate on, uh, technical skills. So it's a very hands-on career. It requires knowledge and it has really direct application. Um, so for many people, uh, the acquisition of knowledge is enough, but for other people, they wanna be able to apply it. So this is a, a wonderful career that allows you to learn a lot, use your hands and apply it and change people's lives in ways that uh, frankly are unimaginable. Um, the second part of that is what's the best path to get there? Um, and in a way, this is the easy part uh, because as far as I'm concerned, there, there is no path better than the path that we offer. Um, we offer, as you probably know, the only program of its kind in Canada. Um, and I'm sure that there, even if there were others, they would not be able to amass the critical mass of expertise and networking um, that you've heard about. So we have, not surprisingly, the world leaders uh, in Toronto being the big city it is and being at University of Toronto. Um, and we have incredible physical resources, which I'm not gonna touch too much on. I will leave that uh, for the next two speakers. And I think maybe with that note, are we passing it on to Scott or Kelly next? Yes, thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Um, I'm also very excited to hear about more about our program. Um, and yeah, Hard House definitely is my favorite place on campus too. And it does feel like you're in Harry Potter every time <laughs> you can go there. So next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Hamilton, who's a professor in our department and the scientific director of Mount Sinai Fertility. Um, and he's also very involved in the course delivery within our program. He teaches several courses. So I'll pass the mic off to you, Scott. So I can share my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Great. Somebody's decided to start working outside our <laughs> clinic here all of a sudden. <laughs> So I'm, I'm Scott Hamilton. Um, I'm going to give you the old person's view of clinical embryology. Kelsey's going to give you the young person's view of it. Uh, I did my first egg retrieval as a clinical embryologist in 1990. So um, that wasn't much after it really started with, with humans. Um, I, I do get to teach uh, part of four courses, I think, in this, in this program and two of the big hands-on ones that are going on right now. We do have a skills lab that we're very excited about. It, it, it should be in full um, full force and running after Christmas. It's been, uh, it's been getting up and going with lots of equipment coming in up until now, but it's, uh, it's gonna be awesome after Christmas. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about being a clinical embryologist, more from a historical and really what you can expect to be in it. So it's challenging and it's rewarding. Um, arguably, Robert Edwards was the first clinical embryologist and he, he contributed to the, to the birth of the first test tube baby, which um, it doesn't seem like a long time ago to me, but it might seem like a long time ago to you, 1978. And the field, it's, it's experienced explosive growth from that time until now. And I've watched it personally since 1990. It evolved with individuals from research fields involved in man, uh, animal sciences. There was no real training to do human work because nobody had ever done it before. Fortunately, there's um, a fair amount of similarities between different animal eggs, different animal sperm and embryos. Um, the timing, the way things happen actually can be similar and be good models for humans. So there is material to work with, even if you're not directly doing the clinical embryology at the start. Um, and so we, we got to bridge the gap kind of between research applications and then bringing it into the clinical realm. And it, until very recently, <clears throat> like maybe the last five to 10 years, there's been a little bit of um, 
formal education um, courses related to getting people into clinical embryology. But for the most part, people have learned more by an apprenticeship where you take your basic science background and we train you how to apply that. And then more importantly, the technical skills that you, that you need on a day-to-day -day basis. So now programs such as this, um, they hope to actually build a clinical embryologist from the ground up. So getting the basic science background and then um, pair that with the hands-on training. And this program, I personally think it's awesome. I, I didn't have something like this when, when I was coming through. And it really is good to, to have the ethics and the statistics and um, the basic biology tied in specifically applied to what you're going to do in the lab. So it's, it's a great program from the way it's been designed. So the work input into the clinical embryology, it's based on fertility treatment cycles um, and current cycles or those linked to banked gametes or embryos that have been there for future use. Physicians and clinical teams, they have to coordinate the ovarian and the uterine cycles to generate the optimal retrieval of, of gametes, which are eggs and sperm, um, and get the best embryos from these. The embryology cycle includes the oocyte retrieval or an egg thaw if the eggs have been frozen and more and more that's a new thing that's within the last 10 years we've actually been able to freeze eggs really well which has given rise to patients that um, don't are, aren't able to produce viable eggs themselves so they can now use donor eggs which that was not really available until the last uh, decade and increasingly now uh, and that leads to embryo culture, embryo transfer, um, thawing and transfer frozen embryos, uh, freezing of gametes, freezing of embryos. All of these, the clinical embryologist participates in. And it's, it's basically a, a seven day gamete to embryo experience is the limit of the window. But with freezing, you can extend that decade sometimes. And there's various optional. Um, variations that can be used, frozen gametes, donor gametes, genetic testing, just as an example. And if we look at where our role of this lies, the actual whole fertility treatment portion of it is built around an ovarian cycle. So the physicians and the clinical team basically deal with the 10 days after menstruation that's where viable eggs um, begin to develop in, in maturing follicles. And so that's basically a 10 to 14 day window that the clinical team manages that and the embryology team just kind of waits to see it coming. And then ovulation would normally happen in the middle of a cycle, an egg would be released and it spends about five days if it gets fertilized. So sperm would usually come in through here and it would spend about five days fertilizing and dividing and moving through the fallopian tube. At the end of that five days, it would drop into the uterus if all went well, become a blastocyst and implant. So the clinical embryologist takes the, this phase here, instead of coming from an ovary, it comes from a tube that a physician prepared for you. And all of this happens in tubes and dishes where we, and incubators, and we keep it for five to seven days where it can be transferred back to the uterus. It actually could be transferred back anytime between here and here, but since it normally doesn't reach the uterus until the, like the fifth or sixth day, that's when we do our embryo transfers usually. And again, we can freeze anywhere along this way and thaw out the embryo and pick it up where it left off. So this five to seven day window, this is the job of the clinical embryologist in terms of managing gametes and embryos. And the way that happens is here we've got um, an egg retrieval. So the egg starts out in a tube that the physician has given you. And there's basically two routes it can go. We can, and, the, and those two roots are basically how we get the sperm into it. We can go more of a conventional or standard fertilization route where you put 
nicely prepped sperm, which again, that happens in the lab. We call them andrologists, but, but their clinical embryologists should also be able to do the andrology work. You prep the best sperm and you either squirt it next to uh, a cumulus oocyte complex or a few of them, or if the sperm is not great or there's other reasons that we don't feel that it's likely to accomplish it conventionally, we can over this side um, pick up a single sperm and poke it into an egg, one sperm per egg. So if we retrieve 10 eggs, the clinical embryologist will pick up 10 sperm one at a time and inject it into 10 eggs one at a time. And there's the process down here. This is day zero. So this is the day that the eggs would be retrieved uh, or kind of like the day that the egg would uh, arrive in the fallopian tube. Day two, we look at fertilization. So the egg and the sperm each contribute a half a nucleus and we assess that. It's not every egg and every sperm that's capable of accomplishing that. So there's gonna be an attrition that starts here. Then for a few days, and it's because the embryo and fertilized egg really would like to be in uh, a physiological environment. The less we take them out of incubators, the better it is for the embryos. So we only cult, uh, take them out of culture at selected times when it's important to learn something. So maybe several times over that five day period, we will take them out of the incubator and look at them. There's an increasing availability of time-lapse incubators. So you don't even have to take them out. You can look at them anytime you want inside the incubator. And, and so up at the, and so fertilization would be here. This is maybe two days afterwards, it goes two to four cells, three days afterwards, maybe eight to 12, depending on how late in the day you're looking at it. And then after that compaction and it becomes a blastus over the next two days. So, so then the next rule, so this just shows the egg retrieval. Um, the physician handles this part where there's a probe that's introduced into the vagina and needle aspirates the follicles, and that's a magnified picture of it. Um, we get these tubes, and a physician would show you this nice ultrasound picture of a follicle that is, by the time, um, by the way, when an, a follicle is mature, it's actually about an inch in diameter. So this is actually quite a large thing, a mature follicle. The egg inside of that one inch follicle is about a tenth of a millimeter. And the follicles show up as black because fluid shows up black on ultrasound. And so most of it is fluid. And when they drain the fluid, somewhere in there is this little egg. And our job is to look inside this tube, dump it into a dish, and see where in that big hunk of fluid there is the little egg surrounded by some cells. Uh, we can work inside an isolate, or we can work on a, a laminar flow hood, depending on the type of media you work in. Uh, and then the sperm side of it. So sperm usually arrives in the form of semen that's produced by ejaculation into a cup. We process semen in a biological safety cabinet. And all you do is add a little bit of media to, to kind of prepare the sperm. Then you centrifuge it to remove all the useless stuff from semen and get just the good sperm from it. Uh, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes usually to process semen to get sperm that you want. And then we put the sperm and eggs together. If it's conventionally, we might do it in one of these IVF laminar flow cabinets underneath the microscope, just so you can see that you're adding the sperm to it. Or we might do it in one of those uh, isolates. After we put the sperm and the eggs together by that mechanism, the conventional, it would go into an incubator, whether it's a big box or a, um, a benchtop incubator. And this just is an example of an isolate where the you're working in the incubator environment when you're actually looking at the eggs and sperm and adding the sperm to them. This is what eggs look like when they come out of the follicle. It's called a cumulus oocyte complex. So the egg is inside a tight knot of cells. Again, it's about a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. These are cumulus cells, which are a, a fluffy layer of cells 
uh, granulosa cells from inside the follicle. And if we're doing conventional fertilization, we just squirt sperm next to three to four of these maybe, or sometimes one of them. And this complex is about half a centimeter. So these are actually, you can see them with the naked eye. They don't look as good as this on the microscope, but you can see them with the naked eye. Um, and so if we're gonna do ICSI, we have to get those cells off. So this is an example of ICSI. So now we, inside that uh, cumulus ulcer complex, this is a tenth of a millimeter. We know that this egg has responded to the LH surge because it's released a polar body. Polar body is a little bag of chromosomes um, because an egg needs to be half a cell to receive a sperm that's half a cell. Then they come together to be a whole cell once again. So this is a picture of ICSI. We're going to introduce a sperm into that egg <clears throat> rather than doing it by conventional means. Here's a nice little video of how you capture sperm doing ICSI. So there's a nicely prepped sample of sperm. We've put a very small volume of sperm in that little drop there and using micro manipulation. So that's like one of your computer games, joysticks, one to operate the finding and catching the sperm and one to actually control the egg and roll it around. And so we have to immobilize the sperm because normally the egg electrocutes the sperm and stops it from moving. We don't want a moving sperm inside an egg. So I'll move on to the next one. And now we say we've put the sperm inside the egg. So now it's gonna culture for five to seven days. And I'm just gonna play you back the whole seven days compressed at a pitcher every three minutes, I believe. So when the sperm enters the egg, whether we push it in or whether it gets in naturally, it stimulates continuation of the final meiotic division and it causes a release of that second polar body, which is another bag of chromosomes. And then there's one half a nucleus left from the egg and one half a nucleus forms from the sperm. And so that was fertilized. Then the next day they divide to two to four cells over the course of that day. And I'll speed it up a little bit. And then there are four cells. And then on the third day they go to eight cells. And then on the fourth day, they begin to stick together so you can't count the cells. This little thing I'll show you here, they hatched it because we're going to do uh, embryo biopsy, or sorry, um, biopsy the, the, a layer of the cells. This creates a chute for the cells um, to herniate out so we can grab them. So now you can't actually count those cells very well, so that's compaction. Then they begin to pump a little bit of fluid into the center of the embryo. And there you see the fluid forming. Now that's a blastocele. Then it differentiates into two cell types, an inner cell mass and a trophectoderm layer. Inner cell mass becomes the baby. Trophectoderm layer becomes like a tumor that burrows into the uh, uterus and forms a placenta. And because of this fluid pressure, it's herniating out. And so now we could grab a few of those cells um, to do its uh, pre-implantation genetic screening. So that's, that's the extent of culture. So what else are the jobs of the clinical embryologist? Well, we have to maintain a great environment. So regardless of the work being done, we need to make sure that the incubator is the right temperature, the gas is the right concentration, because that's what controls the pH. We need to prove that we did that. So we've got checklists of a million different types that we're ticking off. Yes, the temperature, we checked it, it's right. The gas, we checked it, it's right. The, the fridge is the right temperature. Our media is, hasn't expired. All of, the, all of the solutions need to be verified safe internally or by the suppliers. Um, we also have to report our cycle outcomes to clinical teams, to patients, to registries. Um, we do some, some updating of, sorry, on a, on a regular basis. Um, so, and this is just a picture of some of the tanks that we store embryos in. We have to monitor to the levels of those. Uh, an example of a checklist, an example of a room temperature, a gas thing that we're, that we're monitoring. Uh, typical work categories, 
data entry, dish and device labeling, and dish preparation, 15% of your life. Patient interaction, ID verification, progress reporting, 5% of your life. Quality control, equipment function, verification, and, and maintenance of equipment. So that's temperature reading, gas tank reading, doer measuring and filling, 15% of your life. Clinical team, information sharing and communication, 5% of your life. Outcome, follow-up, entry and presentation of the data, 5% of your life. In-house case studies and abstract preparation for meetings, 2% of your life. Complaining about workload and unpredictable scheduling, 1% of your life. Technical work, the fun stuff, uh, 52%. So it's still okay. You got 52% satisfaction. And that's what I got for you. Next, I'll stop my screen. Thank you. And I am very sorry, I'm not going to be able to stick around for the round tables. I, I have to catch a train to, to be back. So, but I'll watch Kelsey. Brandon, you're muted. Did a screen die? Are you able to share your screen, Kelsey? Uh, yeah, I can just go and start sharing. Yeah, you go ahead, you can introduce afterwards. Okay. You can tell them where you've been. Um, yeah, I'll start sharing my this is, this is Kelsey Halawishka. She's one of my fine protégés. She went through kind of a combination of the, uh, the university system with a great Guelph background. And then she apprenticed under me partially and finished. My goodness, that. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what My computer just completely froze and I couldn't do anything. So I'm so sorry about that. Um, I have a border call. I blame it on the dog. Share another screen. See, I, I, that's never happened to me before. I'm, like, I'm, I'm pretty embarrassed. So sorry, everybody. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce um, Kelsey Halawushka. Sorry if I mispronounce that. Um, and she will give a talk on the day in the life of an embryologist, as her title slide suggests. All right, can I take it from here? Okay, so as everyone said, I'm Kelsey Halawushka, and so I'm an embryologist. Can't oh. hear you. Can't hear me? Hold on. I can hear you. I can you, hear you. It's just, it's just Brandon. Brandon. I'm not muted, so. No, you're fine. Can everyone else? Everyone else can hear. OK. Um, we'll go back to my presentation then. Um, so my name is Kelsey Halawushka, and I'm an embryologist at the Reproductive Care Center in Mississauga, Ontario. And I'm first off, before I start my presentation, you're going to have to excuse. I do have. One of my cats here, she went to the vet today and she's being unnecessarily clingy. So she's gonna join us for the entire presentation. Um, hold on, there we go. So I'm going to start quickly through my academic background and how I ended up here as an embryologist today. Um, so I did my bachelor of science at the University of Guelph where I actually majored in marine and freshwater biology. Um, I also did my master's degree at the University of Guelph, where I looked at the effects of antidepressants on the water flea Daphnia magna. Um, because Daphnia magna are so small, they're less than half a centimeter, uh, and their babies which grow in their carapace are even smaller than that, I actually had plenty of time to develop my microscope and my micro manipulation skills. Um, and also during this time, I had to keep these Daphnia alive in a specific environment. Since they're from lakes and ponds, you can't just put them in tap water and hope that they survive. So I had to carefully measure out salts and sugars and dissolve them into water to create the perfect environment. 
Um, this actually led to my first job where after my master's degree, I got into manufacturing in vitro fertilization media. Um, this is where my IVF passion kind of grew and developed. And I began trying to learn everything I could about in vitro fertilization. And at this time I was put into contact with Dr. Scott Hamilton, who was a lab director at the time at the Reproductive Care Center. And he happened to be looking for a junior embryologist. So I made the switch and decided to become an embryologist. So none of my pictures are showing. I don't think any of those are showing, which is great. Um, so that's gonna be kind of boring, sorry about that. Um, so I'm just gonna walk through all of the major events that occur daily in the IVF lab. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the egg retrieval. So during the egg retrieval, we work very closely with the doctor, nurses and ultrasound technicians to retrieve as many eggs as possible. Um, the doctor using a vaginal ultrasound will drain the follicular fluid from each uh, ovary and follicle into a test tube. And then us as embryologists will take those test tubes and we'll put them under a microscope into a search dish and we'll search for all of the eggs. So the embryologist will then collect all of the eggs and place them into an incubator where they'll wait to either be frozen or fertilized. Um, so as Scott previously mentioned, uh, there are two methods of fertilization. They are ICSI and conventional IVF. So prior to fertilization, an embryologist or in some clinics, an andrologist will prep a semen sample through a density cent centrifuge uh, gradient and washes. And this will prep the sperm to have the, just the best sperm possible for ICSI or IVF. Um, ICSI, which actually stands for the intracytoplasmic sperm injection, is where an embryologist will select a single sperm and inject it into each mature egg. Uh, under the microscope, we'll look at the sperm and based on morphology, we'll choose a good quality sperm for the injection. Uh, the, in the egg will be held into place under the ICSI scope with a holding pipette that applies a light suction to it. Um, I had a picture which showed how we properly orient it so that the polar body is either facing 12 or six o'clock and you inject on three o'clock at three o'clock. Uh, you probably saw one of those photos though during Scott's presentation. Um, ICSI is often the chosen method for couples with male infertility issues. Um, so things with low concentration of sperm or poor motility of sperm. Um, IVF is usually done with only sperm that has higher counts and good motility. Uh, and conventional IVF may not always be successful. So we may have to do a rescue ICSI the day after we do uh, conventional IVF insemination. So after fertilization, we have to follow the embryos that have successfully fertilized for six days. At our clinic, we assess the embryos on day one, day three, and day five and six post fertilization. Uh, the day after fertilization, we're looking for those two pronuclei, which Scott pointed out in his presentation, which indicates the successful fertilization. Okay. Uh, the day, so we, that indicates successful fertilization as, sorry, that indicates the successful fertilization. On day three, we are watching uh, to see how the embryos divide um, and see how many cells they are and whether they're or not they're symmetrical. And then these cells will start to compact and form a morula, and then they cavitate and become a blastocyst. And you can tell that they have a blastocyst or they become a blastocyst when they have that inner cell mass and those trophectoderm cells. Um, once they reach that blastocyst stage, we can either transfer and do a fresh transfer into a patient take a biopsy of the embryo for genetic testing, or we can freeze the embryo for later use. So during an embryo transfer, uh, it can happen either with a fresh day five embryo, or we can do it with a previously frozen embryo um, that we've thawed. During this procedure, a doctor will place a catheter just past a person's cervix with the help of ultrasound guidance. And an embryologist will then load the embryo into the inner catheter, which is threaded through the outer catheter, and the embryo is deposited into the uterus. Um, we actually load the embryo surrounded by two air bubbles because embryos are microscopic and they can't be seen on the ultrasound, but air comes across as bright white on ultrasounds. 
And this is a good visual reference that shows us that the embryo should be properly placed within the uterus. And then as an embryologist, we double check those catheters to make sure that the embryo didn't stick inside the catheter. Um, during an embryo biopsy, a few of those trophectoderm cells are removed from the embryo and those cells are sent to a lab for genetic testing. This is done with a similar setup to ICSI. However, instead of an injection pipette, um, there is a biopsy pipette that can suck up some of those cells and using a laser, we can just cut them off. Um, and this is done in order to determine if an embryo has the normal number of chromosomes. So pre-implantation genetic testing can determine whether or not a embryo will be aneuploid or euploid, and they can even detect genetic conditions uh, like hemophilia or cystic fibrosis. And it would even tell if the embryo would actually have the genetic condition, just be a carrier or is completely unaffected by the genetic condition. Um, and then after either doing genetic testing or if there are any extra transfer or any extra embryos after transfer, the embryos can be frozen and stored for a future transfer. And we freeze them in liquid nitrogen, which allows them to cool rapidly so that ice crystals don't form. And this way patients don't have to undergo multiple retrievals to have multiple children. And this method can also be used to freeze unfertilized eggs. And this allows patients to preserve their fertility if they aren't ready to have children yet, or if they need to go through chemotherapy. And my final slide here, I've just written a very typical clinical schedule for us at my um, clinic. So at 6.30 a.m., that's when we start. We arrive to the clinic and we begin assessing all of our embryos. And at 7 a.m., we start the embryo biopsies and freezing. Um, a lot of these things are happening at the exact same time. There are multiple embryologists, so we need to be aware of whatever everything that's going on at the same time. Uh, around 7.30 at our clinic is when we start doing our thaws for our transfers that day. We have multiple retrievals. Um, usually we have somewhere between one to four retrievals in a day, and they would start at 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and 11 a.m. So that those are happening while another embryologist is also doing that embryo biopsy. Um, around 11 is when we do our embryo transfers. And then around 11.30 is when we would start our ICSIs. Um, we generally do our ICSIs three to four hours after our retrievals. So if we have an 8 a.m. Uh, retrieval, we're doing the ICSI around 11.30, 12. And all, all of this has to be balanced with uh, prepping all of our dishes for all of our upcoming procedures. All the sperm prepping, we do it at our clinic. We don't have andrologists. Um, we have to also make patient phone calls and update them about how their cycles are going. We have to maintain the liquid nitrogen doers, make sure that they're um, full and topped up and other equipment maintenance, like Scott was talking about, making sure that our incubators are the proper temperature, proper CO2 levels. Um, we have to test all of the media as it comes in and make sure that it meets all of our specifications and all of that. So it's a very busy environment. Uh, there are a whole bunch of moving parts and many, many things happening at once. So it's a very exciting job to have. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And sorry if I um, was started talking like in the middle of your presentation earlier. My entire like Zoom just crashed and I had to reset it, so it wasn't. Nope, functional. you're good. You're good. Yeah, sorry, you didn't swear. That. That's good. <laughs> I know. I purposely didn't, <laughs> just in case. Um, so yeah, next up, I would like to introduce the pathologist assistant team who will um, speak to you all today. So first off is. Um, Dr. Fang Liu, who is an associate professor in the department, as well as the field director for the pathologist assistant program. Um, after she's done speaking, um, she'll hand the mic off to William Sui, who is a pathologist assistant, as well as the education and clinical coordinator for the PA program in our department. And Amy Calavini, who is a pathologist assistant um, 
who has kindly agreed to come and present like what it's like to be um, a day in the life of a pathologist to all of you today. So yes, welcome, um, Dr. Liu. Hello, hi. Thanks for coming to the meeting, uh, to the to this information session. Uh, I want to leave as much time as possible for uh, for Will and Amy because they prepare a, a great presentation about uh, what what it means to be a pathologist assistant as well as our program. But I just want to say that as a practicing pathologist who works in the academic center, uh, really the work of PA affects my my work like on a daily basis, not only because they help, they are like, essential for in helping me to diagnose breast cancer, uh, but also uh, in training the next generations of doctors, uh, pathologists, and uh, even surgeons or on and oncologists as well. And they are also even involved in things like uh, quality insurance, quality improvement in research and in administration. And uh, just in terms of our program, uh, even though our program is fairly new, uh, I'm, uh, all our teachers are actually very experienced and passionate teacher who have been teaching uh, teaching residents and as well as um, as a other a student from other pathologist assistant program for a long time. So so it's, they are definitely a great teacher. Uh, and also uh, I can say that we probably can expose you to the largest number of complex specimen of all the all the program out there because we are affiliated so because we are affiliated with all the like uh, academy hospital in in uh, in Toronto and we are also affiliated with uh, Ontario forensic pathology service so in terms of like um, the complexity and the volume of the specimen that you will be exposed to and getting training from during your two years here I can grant you that will be a very good experience and then finally you know you will also get great research experience working with expert researchers at U of T the University of Toronto through the capstone project, uh, which will finish off uh, basically your two years. Uh, okay, so uh, without further ado, I'll pass on the mic to uh, Will and Amy. Thanks, Fang. Uh, thanks for those kind words. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen so everyone can see the presentation. Uh, so first of all, uh, can you? Oh, yes, first slide. So first of all, thank you for everyone uh, who's taken the time to kind of join us to this uh, for this uh, information night uh, for the uh, clinical embryology as well as the pathologist assistant uh, field. So, um, you know, this short presentation between AIM and I, we hope to, you know, kind of give everyone uh, a glimpse of, you know, what a pathologist assistant is uh, and, you know, to highlight some of the key aspects of kind of like who we are, you know, what we do, uh, you know, how the job market is, because that's, you know, an important question, right, for any prospective student. Um, you know, as as I, as we said, we're going to talk about like kind of you know what we do like in a hospital setting uh, specifically, and uh, you know if this profession is sort of something that you're interested in. Um, you know, if you'd like to be part of like the PA community, um, we hope to also emphasize a little bit about the skills that uh, is required to be a successful PA, uh, and then finally to highlight. Um, you know, I give you everyone an overview about uh, our program here at U of T. So um, again, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the uh, clinical and education uh, coordinator for the, uh, for the PA uh, side of the program. Uh, I did my uh, undergrad at UTSC in cell biology uh, and then concurrently did uh, my um, master's in pathology assistance at, uh, at Western. Um, uh, afterwards, I I gained some experience uh, working in the community hospitals, uh, also doing some forensic autopsies on the side, and then uh, finally uh, working in, uh, in a big uh, academic hospital. Uh, so I'm currently a uh, pathologist assistant at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. So Amy? Hey, thank you. Hi everyone, very happy to be back here again for our third session. Um, I'm also a pathologist assistant working at Mount Sinai Hospital. And so this slide is basically to show you like Dr. Shapiro was saying, it's very important to highlight all of the experience that we had, which led us to this job. So I did my um, Bachelor of Science with a Physiology Specialization at McMaster University and graduated in 2018. So while I was there, I had the opportunity to participate in a research thesis, which gave me more hands-on experience. And I thought research was sort of what I wanted, but I didn't want to dedicate my entire career to only research. I also worked in an animal research facility and the anatomy lab, and that gave me more hands-on dissection experience, which kind of correlated exactly with what I wanted to do and be a pathologist assistant. 
So I recently completed my pathologist assistant master's at Western University in 2020. You'll notice that is 10 years later than Will completed his. <laughs> and while I was there, Thanks. I was involved. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I was involved again with more research project and quality improvement, which is another key feature of our jobs. And wherever you go, you'll be involved in quality improvement and assurance. Um, throughout my rotation there, I was able to participate in different community placements in London, as well as Toronto, in autopsy suites and surgical grossing labs. And my coursework there focused on anatomy and pathology. So all in all, exactly where I want to be. Great, so I know we started saying PA and pathologist assistant, we kind of throw that out there without really explaining what it is. So this slide is basically to show you what the definition or what mine and Will's definition of a pathologist assistant is. And so the word assistant can be a little bit misleading. So I don't consider myself to be an assistant. We consider ourselves to be physician extenders to pathologists. So it's important to highlight that the roles that we have now were all traditionally performed by pathologists. And so all of the jobs that we are doing now, this job was created to fill a gap. So then pathologists can focus more on the microscopic side of things. And then there's now a specialized role being the PA to do all of the gross pathology and hands-on work in the lab. So we are also members of the pathology team with practical laboratory knowledge and advanced academic training in anatomy, pathology, and pathophysiology, or how diseases come to be. Um, while we are in the gross lab and autopsy suite, we're responsible for providing accurate as well as timely processing of all pathology specimens and tissue. And again, we work under the supervision of pathologists and the sites can vary. So we can work in teaching hospitals, community hospitals, as well as a forensic pathology service. And then again, just one last thing, we can also work in private labs in Canada as well. So that's who we are. Now, what do we do? So we mentioned briefly, we work in two main areas being surgical pathology and autopsy pathology. And depending on where you end up working and what your research interests are, what your academic interests are, the hospital or institution that you work at can be only surgical pathology, it can be only autopsy pathology, or it could be a combination of both. Um, so while we're in the gross lab or in surgical pathology, we perform thorough macroscopic examination, as well as documentation, dissection, and sampling of surgically removed tissue. So this can range from any shape and size of tissue. So the small specimens that we will receive are biopsies and small excisions. So for example, um, once you hit, I guess it is 50, now you go for a colonoscopy. And at that time, the clinicians are looking for any polyps or suspicious areas of disease, and they take small pieces of tissue out, which will then come to the gross lab, where we will process them. Moving a little bit up from that, if you've ever had appendicitis or chronic appendix issues, you'll have your appendix taken out or an appendectomy. And that will also come to the gross lab and be processed by a PA first. Um, as we move into larger resections, they can be for benign or malignant reasons. So you can have a hysterectomy or a surgical removal of the uterus. Um, if your colon biopsy came back as cancer, then you can have a colectomy or a larger resection of colon. And these are just other more specialized, larger resections that we can receive in the lab. From there, if you have a very locally invasive mass, you can have multi-organ resections. And those are going to be um, the most challenging surgical specimens that I think we can get. And the other side of things, we will work in the autopsy suite. And so there we will assist pathologists with autopsy duties. And this will be quite variable depending on where you go to work, depending on like your roles and responsibilities, as well as what the pathologist um, has their expectations. So um, these are some of the things that you can or may not be doing. So evisceration or removing organs, dissecting each individual organ, and then sampling areas that are suspicious or clinically concerning. And then from there, we can also assist in rendering macroscopic diagnoses. So if that didn't sound like enough, we've listed out a few more roles that we can typically have in the gross lab as well as autopsy suite. So pathologist assistants, as we mentioned, are kind of the point person in the gross lab. And so that means that we are um, good candidates to be a lab manager. So working in a day-to-day -day workload in the gross room and autopsy suite. And because we are the lab experts, you're kind of the point person for all questions coming from both different labs as well as different, um, different fields throughout the hospital even. So we get calls all the time just asking, can I submit this fluid? Can I submit this tissue? What sort of media should I put this in? And so the lab manager or a PA would know all the answers to those questions. We're, <clears throat> sorry, we're also involved with research. So this is going to be um, variable again, depending on where you work. So being exposed to all the GTA sites, if you're interested in research, a lot of the pathologists that we work with are also involved with doing research. And so that gives us as PAs the opportunity to work with them. And so that can be in any different role. So 
whether it be in tumor banking or taking high quality photographs to be used later on in published peer review papers. Those are all things that we are involved with. And then one of the big, big, big parts of our job is education. So teaching is a huge responsibility for PAs in academic sites. So we see a number of different um, levels of trainees coming through. So we get pathology residents as well as fellows. We get PAs, staff, as well as students and allied health. So we get medical laboratory technicians and assistants and technologists. And then on top of that, we also have high school and university students and volunteers. And so another part of our education is presenting at pathology conferences as well. We're also key consultants. So we can be intraoperative consultants with surgeons. So sometimes the ORs will call us to ask us questions about the gross pathology of a case. And we can also attend multidisciplinary rounds and tumor boards for those cases. And lastly, we wanna highlight that quality assurance is another key aspect of our jobs, similar to how the clinical embryologists were speaking about their maintenance and their rigorous um, upkeep of their tools. We also have similar protocols in place for the gross lab and the autopsy suite. And so all of this, um, ensures that we're promoting high quality care and patient safety through standard and safe work practices. Okay, so um, I just wanted to give everyone sort of like an overview of kind of what happens like in the pathology lab, i.e., you know, how do the samples kind of travel through the lab and kind of makes its way from the patient to, you know, ended up uh, and uh, for the patient to end up with a diagnosis. So uh, pathology is one of those, you know, few fields in lab medicine where it's still very, very hands-on and still very complex, uh, you know, compared to, let's say, like getting a, a tube of blood taken and, you know, getting your CBCs levels and your sugar levels kind of taken. A lot of the, those kind of like lab medicine is still very automated, uh, but pathology itself is still quite hands-on uh, and requires, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of like an army of staff to, you know, uh, from start to finish. So uh, this little diagram kind of shows an overview of kind of what happens. So starting from the, the very beginning, as Amy mentioned, uh, if you have an appendix taken out, for example, uh, the tissue is you know, removed by the surgeon, then it, it kind of makes its way out into uh, the pathology lab. Um, once it enters the lab, it, uh, it, enters, it gets entered into our system where we log the specimen in so we can kind of track its progress from start to finish. Uh, and then really the next step is actually it lands on uh, you know, the PA's bench or my bench. Um, and so we're sort of like the guardians of like the tissue uh, where we, uh, we handle the, the tissue physically. Um, we would kind of describe uh, kind of what we have. Uh, we would look for the, the offending pathology and the offending areas that are of interest, uh, whether it be a tumor or areas that kind of show, you know, why this appendix was inflamed. Uh, we would, you know, use scalpel blades and like take sections and take samples of the uh, of the tissue and then that kind of gets sent on to the lab where it gets processed uh, basically changing the state from the tissue from a physical state uh, into sort of like a microscope slide so um, you know turning that piece of tissue into something that you can see under the microscope also is another uh, you know a large process which I won't really touch on but that generally is kind of what happens uh, so the end product um, before uh, when Fang gets, you know, her her uh, her specimen is really she's looking at the microscope slide where she can, uh, you know, look at the microscopic levels of the uh, the appendix and to come up with a diagnosis and therefore an answer to the, the patient as to you know why the patient is sick. Okay, so um, you know, PAs uh, specifically were sort of like a cog in a larger machine, so to speak, uh, but still quite hands on. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the profession uh, itself. So uh, we're actually a relatively unknown profession to the public and even amongst like healthcare professionals. Um, it's not surprising that I still get uh, nurses and healthcare practitioners ask me, I don't know what a pathologist assistant is. It's kind of interesting. And we literally work either on the same floor or just the floor above each other. So, um, and again, as Amy mentioned, we're, we're sort of like a uh, a pathologist extender or like a physician extender where, uh, you know, in a healthcare setting so that we act as a, a liaison between uh, the pathology lab and other departments, um, you know, to, you know, answer any technical questions that they have about, uh, you know, specimen management uh, and just to really ensure the, the highest quality of care. Um, historically, the demand for PAs has been pretty high uh, in Ontario as well as Canada. Um, uh, 
uh, because we're such a small profession, we're still an unregulated medical profession. Um, although we do have a growing number of formally trained PAs and workplaces are continually looking for graduate level trained PAs. Um, and of course, like we're a very small tight community. So uh, we're always on the lookout for, you know, young talents who, you know, want to break into the profession. Um, I've got some other pictures of you know, us working in the lab environment. So this is, uh, this is Brian, one of our, our actually our senior PA who's, uh, who's uh, you know, doing a dissection, uh, grossing a, uh, a tumor on his bench. Uh, you can see that, you know, he's got everything kind of laid out. He's got his, his tools and he's taking appropriate sort of samples to, uh, you know, help guide, um, you know, the, the surgeons and the oncologists for, uh, for the proper diagnosis and treatment process. Okay, uh, this is Leanne. She's working on something really, really small under a dissecting microscope. So uh, one of the uh, neat things that we do here at Mount Sinai is sometimes like we work with like very, very small specimens. So, um, you know, uh, whether it be like something that's very, very large, that's like a 20 pound tumor or something that's very, very small, like, you know, size of a walnut. So um, the process is still very similar. It still requires a, you know, a fine motor skills and a good knowledge of like anatomy and pathology. Um, this is another interesting photo. So um, here we're doing an exercise of uh, injecting placentas. Uh, so what we're doing is we're, we're perfusing um, the, the vessels of the placenta with uh, colored dyes. Uh, what we're really looking for are um, what we call vascular anastomoses. So, um, you know, just a, a, a brief uh, anatomy lesson for placentas, especially for twins. So uh, twins themselves, they, they share, uh, they, they, they share sort of like a placenta where um, uh, both twins normally, they, they have separate vascular supplies, uh, although even though they share the same placenta, uh, but there are rare instances where um, there are blood vessels that kind of cross over uh, and there are important um, clinical implications where um, if there is uh, unequal sharing of blood, uh, it can actually uh, uh, affect both twins negatively. And so um, this is sort of like one of the exercises we do to tr try and uh, find if there are any uh, vascular anastomoses. So um, looking at them with the naked eye is very difficult. So what we do is we inject each of the different veins and arteries of both twins with different colors. And then we look for any areas that we see uh, mixing of, of dyes. Uh, it's a very you know simple concept, but it does require um, you know a steady hand. Um, and then you can see in the picture there we do and we've identified a, a, one of the superficial anastomoses on the placental surface. Okay. Great, thanks. So now I wanna talk a little bit more about what we can do off bench or out of the autopsy suite. So this is an interesting initiative that I took part in during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is obviously still going on, but this was initiated in 2020 in around March. And so typically in the gross lab, you're going to have people coming in and out all the time to learn about gross pathology. And so at our site, we'll have residents come in on a daily basis and they'll be looking at a specimen. You'll have a hot seat where a senior staff member will be asking them questions about gross pathology, as well as how you would sample it, what you would describe, what you would measure, all things like that. And so because of COVID-19, this kind of was halted very early on during the pandemic. And so we shifted this to be an online program. The next slide. So what we did was film these sessions. So every Friday, we'll broadcast these sessions live um, to an audience consisting of residents, pathologists, staff, as well as PA students and trainees. And so these rounds started with maybe 15 to 20 participants, and now they've grown to be 80 to 100 people every single Friday. And so this is a very unique experience for PAs and pathologists to collaborate together, as well as broadcast to a national audience to show what gross pathology is, as well as hear different perspectives from a PA as well as a pathologist on gross pathology. And so this here is just sort of a collage of different specimens that we've worked on. So in the upper left, we've got an appendix. Um, in the bottom middle, we've got a hemorrhagic kidney. I'll do one more time. It's okay. Perfect. And then you can see a colon on the left-hand side as well, femoral head on the bottom. And so it just kind of highlights the variety of surgical specimens that we talk about. And because there's, if you can think of how many organ systems there are, there's going to be so many variations of pathology as well as patient-dependent pathology. And so it's important to kind of 
broadcast this to a national audience and get participation from all across Canada. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, I know we're running short on time, so uh, I'll try to talk a little faster. Uh, here's a slide to kind of give everyone a general overview about uh, the uh, the PA field uh, program itself. Uh, we're generally split into two years. Uh, year one, it's really like the first two semesters. Um, all the prospective students can expect to, you know, be immersed in a full course load, which uh, will teach you uh, all the the, fun the fundamental skills that we believe that a that a uh, that a PA should have in the future. So, uh, you know, uh, you know in-depth detail of like graduate level anatomy, uh, pathology, obviously, but we also want to give you, uh, you know, the experience of like, you know, lab management, bioethics, and biobanking. Uh, you know, th these are uh, just a, an excerpt of some of the skills that we think that are very, very important for, um, you know, PAs to kind of have, uh, not just to know how to cut things and kind of what to look at in terms of anatomy, but really like the broader picture of like healthcare itself. Um, and then year two, which I personally think this is where the fun begins. Um, this is like your practical year where you uh, get to uh, rotate into, uh, you know, all the seven uh, clinical sites that have partnered with us uh, that will, you know, help give you the practical experience and apply the knowledge that you've learned in the first year. Um, this is just a, a list of like some of our clinical affiliations where uh, all our students will rotate through uh, we'll work with the PAs who are hired there and that will kind of teach you uh, as a group or one-on-one on, -one on uh, all, you know, all the necessary skills, uh, including like surgical pathology and autopsy pathology. Uh, also concurrently in the second year, uh, all the students get to work on a research project of their interest um, and they'll be, you know, working closely with a supervisor of their kind of choosing um, to also, you know, exercise their, uh, their, their research uh, skills. Uh, and then on top of that, if it's not busy enough, uh, we get the students to uh, participate in the in weekly in-depth lectures, uh, and then we teach them all the different uh, major pathology subspecialties. And all those kind of subjects are taught by, you know, our uh, impressive array of, uh, of LMP uh, lecturers. Uh, next, uh, I just have a couple photos that, uh, that we were doing a, a workshop. So you can see, um, you know, this this is, uh, this is our first class of, uh, of PA students who are currently in their second year. So they're doing their practice right now. So uh, this is a, a shot of uh, us doing what we call a GI specimen presentation. So uh, we're doing, uh, uh, we've pulled it up a bunch of like GI specimens that we think that are quite interesting. And then we're sort of talking about uh, all the different pathologies that, uh, that are pertinent for uh, this specific uh, subspecialty. Uh, we're getting the students to kind of handle them and touch them, and then we can kind of like actively discuss what are what are interesting things and how they would kind of approach, uh, you know, handling these kinds of like specimens and kind of what to look out for. Uh, the next part I think is kind of a fun exercise. Uh, this is a manual. She's one of the PAs at at UHN. Uh, this sort of exercise was inspired a little bit by YouTube, uh, where we're using Play-Doh to help to get the students to kind of recreate uh, a very complex specimen. So what they're doing right now is they're, they're recreating a, a Whipple's procedure. So uh, if anybody has heard of Steve Jobs, um, you know, unfortunately Steve Jobs had pancreatic cancer. And so uh, one of the surgical procedures is uh, when we remove the pancreas is called a Whipple's procedure um, where we don't just, we can't just take out the pancreas because it's in a very uh, complex and anatomical sites where a bunch of organs has to be taken out in order to, uh, take out the pancreas. So um, we devised this sort of fun exercise to get the students to, you know, learn the anatomy while kind of having fun building it. And, uh, you know, you see Emmanuel kind of coaching all our students to kind of, you know, how to go about building this. And then, of course, once they're done, um, you can see in the middle screen, that's the, an example of like the Whipples. So uh, this is like the distal I don't know if you guys see my cursor. Uh, this is the distal stomach. You've got your duodenum here, and there's your pancreas with your common bowel duct and your pancreatic duct. Uh, you know, once we get the students to kind of build it, they get to dissect and gross it, as well as like take the appropriate section. So it's a sort of a very immersive, and I, I'd say it's a very fun and creative way to, you know, uh, learn about the anatomy of a very rare and complex specimen. So um, I think that kind of highlights like one of the, fun things that we're doing, uh, not just, you know, 
uh, going through the daily motions of like the practical, but also we're trying to be innovative in terms of like trying to augment and supplement everyone's um, uh, learning. Okay. Um, so, I mean, why pick U of T? So I, I think uh, University of Toronto, it's it obviously is Canada's like premier institution for learning and discovery and knowledge creation. Um, you know, four of our partnering cl clinical sites are rated as uh, one of the top 100 hospitals in the world last year. Uh, and lastly, uh, our program is currently seeking accreditation from NACLS, uh, which is really the gold standard for uh, PA programs. Uh, the graduating students, uh, once we're accredited, they're allowed to write the American ASCP exam, which is a licensing exam for PAs, uh, as well as the, uh, the Canadian licensing exam, uh, which is designated as a triple CPA. Okay, so currently only two of the five programs uh, that train PAs are NACLS accredited and we hope to be, uh, you know, part of that group. Great, so after hearing all of this, I think the main question you should be asking yourself is, is this for me? Uh, this is a very small program and it is a highly specialized field and so you want to make sure that this is something that you're interested in doing prior to applying. So. This is for you if you love hands on laboratory work in a very high stress and dynamic environment. This is for you if you want to be continually learning throughout your entire career, as well as have opportunities for teaching and research. And last but not least, probably the most important piece is that you want to be making a positive impact in patient care and being part of that healthcare team. So we'll end off on this, but we have a few resources about the profession. So the American and Canadian counterparts um, just listed off here. And so you can check out these resources for exam information as well as more um, academic resources. That's it. Thank Thanks, you, Brandon. Sir. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, thank you both very much. It was very informative. We really appreciate you guys coming out and <clears throat> sharing that with us. Um, so yeah, next up, I would like to introduce um, Mariam Khalil, who is a student in our department. She's a PhD candidate, and she is one of the co-presidents of CLAMS. Um, she does a lot of great work within our department to help benefit students. So we just wanted to invite her to um, speak to prospective students, kind of the type of initiatives they're currently working on. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. One second. So you guys can see my screen, right? Okay. Yes. So hello, everyone. Um, I hope you guys are um, finding this information night very helpful. I'm Marian, and I'm currently a third year PhD candidate in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Um, I'm currently working in Dr. Ming Chao's lab at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and I'm studying um, the combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy um, in non small cell lung cancer. And I'm also the co president of our um, Graduate Student Council, also known as Confederation of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology Students. So CLAMPS is basically an elected um, student council that represents and advocates for LMP student body to the departments of LMP, as well as the Faculty of Medicine and Graduate Student Union. So here's the picture of our current CLAP members, CLAMPS members for um, the year 2021 to 2022. So CLAMPS hosts a variety um, of events to enrich your graduate school experience throughout the school year. Um, and these events would include academic as well as professional development events. Um, we also host community outreach, um, socials, as well as recreation and wellness events. The main objective of CLAMPS is basically to build um, a strong LMP community by fostering relationships between students from diverse backgrounds, schools of study, and various research sites and research backgrounds. Great. So as CLAMPS, we are responsible for organizing a lot of academic programming for the LMP students, including academic seminars, as well as information sessions. Other important programs that we have also include um, annual vendor product shows, which is a very great opportunity for students to check out new technologies in the scientific industry. And as part of CLAMPS or as part of LMP, we host um, LMP research conference every year. And it's, um, it's a yearly tradition that we have. And in our um, research conference that we hold every year, our graduate students, as well as students from the TRP, which is our translational research program within the LMP department, students showcase their research through um, either poster presentations or oral presentations. 
And we are currently working actively to integrate the MH um, Health Science Program. So you guys can also be part of um, the LNPRC in a more um, direct way in the um, upcoming research conferences that we're planning to host um, probably next year. This year, um, our department had the opportunity to pilot two mentorship programs um, in, um, in conjunction with CLAMS. So um, we have launched a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program and an alumni to graduate student mentoring program um, while working with, closely with the LMP department. So students who are interested in getting mentored will be matched to either a senior graduate student or an alumni of the department. And these matches are done after a very careful evaluation of mentee expectation, as well as their goals for their career. Um, and then depending on that, we will match these mentees to um, appropriate mentors for the um, upcoming academic year. So in addition to the academic activities, CLAMPS also hosts a variety of social activities to promote um, student interaction as well as um, fostering a sense of community. So most of the times, um, or majority of the times, we host ga um, game nights, trivia events, Jeopardy. We have a lot of workout sessions as well as paint nights um, and cooking sessions as well as many more activities that we host throughout the year. But due to the current pandemic, we've been hosting a lot of these activities online through Zoom. And um, this gives students as well as um, especially the new first year students give an opportunity to them to um, get to know their fellow class for um, fellow students in a more um, closed way um, because it's not like we go to classes anymore to actually um, see our fellow classmates in person. So these are really helpful to um, incoming first year as well as second year students um, to get to know each other. And finally, um, we also run a couple of initiatives each year. For example, our REACH as well as Science Rendezvous programs. We also have um, high school outreach programs where LP graduate students, as well as students from the TRP are invited to visit um, local high schools to present a short eight to 10 minute presentation about their post-secondary education, as well as research and their career path. This program is um, basically designed to encourage students who are interested in science to ask questions and make science a more approachable um, avenue for those who are interested in uh, pursuing science as a career. And all the student graduate students of LMP, including those from Research Stream, TRP, as well as Health Sciences programs, are encouraged to uh, participate in these outreach activities. And finally, we have our elections that are hosted every year um, before the start of the school year, where all the graduate students have the opportunity to run for election and nominate themselves for various executive positions. And after the election period is over, um, students have the opportunity to be part of CLAMS and um, represent uh, various um, executive positions on the council. And finally, if you guys want to reach out to us, have any questions or concerns about programs or our student society or events that we hold, here's our contact information. And I hope all of you guys found this information, information session very helpful. And I will now pass this back to um, Brandon. Thank you very much, Miriam. Yeah, CLAMPS does such great work for the students in our department, uh, particularly the mentorship program that Miriam mentioned previously. Um, so yeah, I know we're kind of going a lot past time now. Um, so I'm going to open up breakout rooms. So one will be for pathologist assistance and the other will be for clinical embryology. Um, and I'll open it up so you can select which room you want to join to. Um, I know previously we said we would have multiple sessions, but instead we can just keep it open for about 20 minutes and you can um, hop between each session as you would like. Um, the reason for this is, yeah, we're kind of over time and we're running out of time now. Um, I'll also stay in this main room. So if you have any questions for me directly about anything related to the administration of the program, feel free to stay in the main room and ask me. So yeah, I'll open the rooms now. You should get a notification to select which room you want to join in. <laughs> 